Mm. So I will tell you today about Reformer, uh, which is our, our most recent version of Transformer. It's a model <coughs> that we were working on to correct some deficiencies of Transformer so that it can work on really, really long sequences. Uh, and indeed, it allows to scale up Transformer to sequences that have up to a million tokens, uh, which I'll tell you why I find it very exciting. So let's go on. Um, I, I assume you've, you've all heard about deep learning and NLP at least a little bit. And um, it's hard to believe that, that early, like five years ago, um, it, it was unusual to use deep learning in MLP. Um, and I came to this from the angle of machine translation, where, where the systems that were dominantly used to, were phrase-based systems. So phrase-based systems would try to basically apply an advanced dictionary match phrases and then uh, change them to, to, to the other language and recreate a sentence in this way. And the performance of translation systems is usually measured by a metric called blue. And I will not go into what this is, it's the higher the better. And by now we are slowly starting to move to other metrics, but at least in this range that, that it was back then, it was a fairly good metric. So, so phrase-based systems were reaching on this English-German translation that, that's a standard benchmark. They were reaching blue scores of about 21. And then neural networks came and they, you know, they had 19, then larger ones had 20.6. And I remember very well that a lot of people were kind of skeptical. They were like, okay, you take a large data set and you can get the same numbers as we already have, so why? why use this and around 2016 the the first really large lstm based google model finally got to 25 and people were and then it was kicked up to 26 and people were like okay this is this is really good and google launched it in google translate it was large effort and people were, okay indeed deep neural networks can do translation and in some sense, people thought, okay, 26 may be as high as you can ever go. The, you know, human translators get better, but it's a machine. And it was all based on RNNs. So RNNs work as follows. You take a sentence in one language, say Chinese or, or English, and code it with a network that goes word by word or token by token. As you see, token can be a Chinese character. It can be a syllable in English, it, it depends on your tokenizer. And then you start generating it again, step by step, where the way the network operates, it, make, it has a non-linearity in every place where there is an arrow on this picture. So the problem is when the sequence gets really long, when it's more than one sentence, the gradients need to travel a long path to, to get back to the places where, where the corresponding words are in the other sentence. And this is a problem because gradients can vanish and, and, and the learning cannot be very good. And this problem is improved by using this thing called LSTM cells, long short term memory cells or other techniques, but it only helps to the extent that you can do sequences of like 100, maybe 150. So we introduced the model called the transformer, which does away with the RNN structure. In the transformer, everything attends to everything. So the gradient can go to every other word in one step. Every word attends every other word, and you get one step gradients, uh, both for the encoded sentence, and then when you're decoding, you can still only, you can attend everything in the input, but of the output, you can only look at the past. You cannot look at the future. This is called causal attention. So this is the architecture of a transformer, and it has two advantages. For one, it's very parallelizable, so it actually runs faster than the RNNs. And the other point is that the gradients can jump in one hop anywhere. So it's really good at training even when the sequences get longer. And I think that's becoming the main advantage of the transformer and surprisingly 
even a fairly cheap, not super huge transformer model gets 27, 28 blue. And these results have been improving. So we got to 29 and, and then I think people pushed it to 30 now. So, so in terms of the blue metric, we're really on par with human translators. That doesn't mean we have translations on par with human just yet, but, but in many contexts, they're really, really good. So, so this transformer model has been a huge success and it can do really long sequences. And it also works on other tasks, not just translation. Glue is like a set of tasks and, and there was BERT, which is a transformer that's bidirectional and pre-trained and, and it gets to really good results. And it can even generate images for you and it can generate quite long text. So this is a GPT-2 transformer from OpenAI. The green thing is a prompt. So you say in a shocking finding, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns. And then it goes on to generate the story. And as you can see, the story can be fairly readable. It's sometimes hard to say whether it was written by a human or generated by a model. So great, but how about the speed of these models? How about memory and efficiency for long sequences? We know it can learn. We know it can transfer the gradients, but can it do so efficiently? And the problem <coughs> that, that's fundamental to, to how transformer transfer, transfers the gradients is that every position needs to look at every other position. So if you have a sequence of length n, then the multi-head attention has the n squared factor in its computation. And now, if you have a single sentence, then how many words can you have in it? Well, maybe a hundred, it's a long sentence. Maybe you have a whole paragraph and it's 200, maybe it gets to a thousand. A thousand squared is, is not too bad because you need to take into account that there's always the d squared factor in your neural network. d is the depth of your vector and d is usually about a thousand, maybe more, maybe a little less, but so thousand squared is the order of magnitude that you will have to pay anyway. So if n is about a thousand, then, then it's of similar complexity. But when you go to really long sequences, as I said, we're aiming one million here. And one million squared is really prohibitive. This model will not, it will not fit into memory. It will run forever. So that will not work, but how can we remedy it? So when I said attention looks at every, every word looks at every other word, this is true, but it's also true that it does not look in the sense as a convolution does. It does not have a separate weight for it. It just selects the most prominent, the most important positions that, that influence uh, every other word. So even though it's an all to all an n squared operation, what you really want is to consider the subset of the most important, most relevant things, because what it really does is a nearest neighbor search. And from computer science, we know that nearest neighbor searches can be sped up by hashing. So uh, let me explain in one minute how this works. So imagine you have a 2D plane. It's in the picture in the lower right. And you have some points and you want to find nearest neighbors, right? So, so the nearest neighbors of the black ones would be black, the, the, the red ones would be red and, and so on. So one way you can do this approximately is put a few lines in the higher dimensional space that would be hyperplanes and search only within those elements that fall into the same plane. Because if something's close to you, it will probably be on the same side of the line. So as you can see, the black or the green at the bottom, there are three of them, and every one of them is the nearest neighbor of each other, right? While the, for the red one, it's not so clear, right? It can have a nearest neighbor that's not red. So this hashing does not work 100%. But it works with high probability and you can always redo this. You can take another set of planes and rehash and try to find the nearest neighbor again. So this allows you to get much better complexity because now you don't need to consider all elements for every element. You, you have these subsets which you only look within a subset and then maybe you redo it a few times to have a better probability. 
So, so this is how people have been speeding nearest neighbor searches. And we apply this to the attention operation. So, so when things are attending other things, we will, instead of doing the n squared things, we'll do the hashing uh, and attend only related things. And this is how it's actually implemented in the reformer model. Uh, imagine you have a sequence of queries and keys. This is your long text that you'll be generating. And then hashing assigns a hash, which here is denoted by a color, so blue, yellow, or red, or white, to every element. So what we do is we sort them by the hash ID, but within the hash ID keeping uh, the time axis, so we can only attend causally to the previous ones. And then we, for efficiency on GPUs and TPUs, we chunk them into like some largish chunks, uh, say of 64 or 128. Um, so these chunks are fixed size, so they may overflow some buckets, and we'll attend within a chunk and maybe within one or two previous ones, too, so, so we handle this overflow. So now here, this x squared factor is only within a chunk, and this is a constant size thing, while we can really handle long uh, things. And the complexity goes down, it's now n log n instead of n squared. So great, so we have now n log n, uh, but we still, if we have n layers, this would still use uh, a lot of memory just to keep the activations. Uh, and the problem is for backprop, you usually need to keep activations for every layer. And we handle this using reversible networks, which is a very nice idea to replace residuals with uh, with an equation that's very similar but allows to reverse the thing and recompute. And with that, we get a model that, that has the memory use of only a single layer input activation while performing as well as a transformer. So, so with reversibility, we can match uh, the performance of a full transformer. And with the LSH attention, the performance can be slightly worse if you use only two hashes, because it's a probabilistic algorithm, right? And the more hashes you use, the more you come to have the same performance. So with 16, it fully matches the transformer, but it costs you a little bit of time. With eight, it, it's slightly worse, but, but it's faster and, and so on. And with sequence length, well, it scales linearly or n log n rather than, uh, quadratically, so, so we can verify it and, and it's, it really runs on sequences of like 100,000 with no problem on an 8 gig GPU and, and on a, with a bit more memory uh, and work, you can push it to 1 million. So, so that's, that's the reformer. It's, it's as good as a transformer and it can really handle sequences that have 100,000 to million tokens. So what does that what does that give you, right? And I, I believe this opens up a world of opportunities. So so what we did in the paper was to generate images. You can generate music. You can generate short videos. Um, these models work really well for generation of anything that that's a sequence. Uh, you can train and generate on the whole books. There is very recently a data set from from Project Gutenberg. Um, that, uh, that has whole sized books. And I think this will be very exciting to make a pre-trained model uh, on that. Uh, I, I, I think this, it will produce some very interesting text, not just on paragraph level, but hopefully coherent over longer stretches. Um, but also like if you start thinking further, so there was very recently, I think last week, a paper about GPT-3 which is a 170 billion weights uh, transformer from OpenAI. And it shows like when you pre-train a huge model on, on all of the text of the web, it starts solving problems just by, just with a prompt. Like you don't need to find you, you don't need to do any training. You just put a prompt and it, and it starts solving things. So, 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 so the interesting question is now, can we just pre-train a model on, on on all of the web 
And whenever there is a task, maybe we roughly filter some web, just put it inside the context, give it, give it well, we have 100,000 per million tokens for that, so we can almost put a whole training set for a lot of tasks as context, saying, look, these are a few examples, now give me the answer. And, and it seems like this might just work and start solving problems without additional training. So, so that's very exciting. And, and maybe we can start, like maybe you can just ask, you know, generate me a, a biography of someone and the model would just retrieve a lot of web pages, read them and, and generate things for you. We, we did something like that with the normal transformer in the paper generating Wikipedia by summarizing long sequences where the input were web pages and the output was a Wikipedia page and that already worked. Uh, reasonably, but I think now it can it will be able to work much better. Um, so, so I think this gives exciting possibilities. And um, Reformer is implemented in Tracks. This is a deep learning li library that's on GitHub, uh, and we we tried to make this one really readable and fairly simple. So the syntax is on NumPy. It can be accelerated by TensorFlow 2 or JAX. Uh, but it's written in pure NumPy. Uh, we match state-of-the-art results on ResNet Transformer, and now we have Reformer. And and the whole the code runs without a single line of change everywhere. CPUs, GPUs, multi-GPU machines, TPUs, uh, TPU pods. Uh, so if you want to take a look, um, here is the link. And I think. Uh, these long sequence models are really opening up uh, many exciting possibilities. Um, thank you.